Welcome to this introduction to mechanical design. The first thing you might wonder is, what is mechanical design? Well, it's the process of choosing the structure, shape, components, and materials to make a machine. Now, this is a very broad topic. There are many, many different things that go into this topic, and you can study it in a lot of depth. But today we're going to have just a very brief introduction to this subject. Now, whether you're designing a huge machine or something very simple, there are a few rules that you can follow that often lead to good designs. So let's talk about some of those. The design rules or principles that we're going to cover in this presentation are as follows. First of all, keep it super simple. We'll talk about what stress concentrations are and why they're bad for designs. We'll see why triangles are so strong and light. We'll talk about what bearings are and how we can use them to allow axles to turn freely. We'll see how we can allow things to slide more easily and some reasons why certain slides tend to jam. We'll talk about what lead-ins are and how they can help things fit together more easily. And we'll also talk about exact constraint, the idea that you should use exactly the right number of constraints and not more or less. So let's get started with the KISS principle. The first principle of design is to keep it super simple. Simpler designs have fewer parts to maintain and fewer places to break or stick. One of my favorite examples of a super simple design is this wine bottle opener. It's super simple because it only has two parts. Each part is solid and so it's relatively indestructible. And it's also super simple to use. Let me show you what I mean. To uncork a wine bottle, I simply place the base on the bottle and place the screw in the cork. Then I just turn the screw until the cork is out of the bottle. What happens is that initially the screw goes into the cork, and then when the screw reaches the base and I keep turning, the screw can't go down anymore, so it pulls the cork up and out of the bottle. Then I take the whole thing away and I'm done. Super simple designs like that are relatively easy to use and relatively easy to maintain. So that's something you should always strive for. If you're designing a structure, you should try and use triangles as much as possible. This is because it's easy for joints to bend, but it's hard for beams to stretch or compress. Let's see why this makes triangles so strong. Imagine that you had a square. Now imagine that you put a load on one edge like this. This is called a shearing load when it pushes the square sideways. Since the square has four corners and those corners are relatively easy to bend, the square ends up sliding over to the side like this. So it deforms. So that's not so good. Now imagine that you have a triangle and you place a shearing load on the triangle. Well, in order for the triangle to shear, one of the the beams would have to lengthen or one of them would have to compress and that's pretty hard to do. So even though this triangle has a shearing load on it, it doesn't go anywhere. That makes triangles pretty strong relative to their weight. So if you need to build something that's strong and lightweight, triangles are a good way to do it. Here are a couple of examples where triangles are used in the real world. Trusses in roofs and buildings often contain many triangles. Towers that hold up electrical wire or antennas often have many, many triangles in the middle of them. And bridges also have beams that are arranged in triangular shapes because triangles are just so strong. All of these, all of these structures need to be strong and lightweight, so they take advantage of triangles to do that. Now let's talk about stress concentrations for a minute, what they are, why they're so bad and how we can avoid them. In order to understand them, we have to first of all understand what stress is. Stress is actually force divided by area. And it's represented by the Greek letter sigma in engineering. Now you might wonder why we care about this and why it's so important. Well, structures often fail because of too much stress, even more than too much force. Let's see why this is. 
Imagine that you have a log and a mallet on top. Okay, The mallet presents a relatively large contact area between the mallet and the log, so the stress is actually relatively small because you're dividing the force by a large area. So that keeps the stress relatively low. So when the mallet moves up and strikes the log, the mallet doesn't do much to the log. It bounces a little bit and the log doesn't break because the stress is relatively low. Now imagine you have the same log, but instead of a mallet, you have a hatchet. Well, the hatchet presents a very small area of contact with the log. And since the area is so small, the stress is actually very large. So when the mallet move, or when the, the hatchet moves up and strikes the log, it creates a large stress, and that is what actually causes the log to split. So often it's the large stress that causes structures to fail, even more than large forces. So let's talk about ways that we can avoid stress concentrations in our designs. Well, stress concentrations often occur at sharp corners like this. Imagine that you have a structure that's constructed like this with a 90 degree angle in it and you apply forces as shown here. What happens is that that corner of that structure is a pretty small area so the stress right in that corner gets pretty high so what tends to happen is that the the structure fails right at that point of high stress. So what can we do to avoid that? Well, there are a couple of things that we can do. Um, the first thing that we can do is we can apply something called a chamfer. A chamfer is a 45 degree angle right at the corner. And that chamfer actually creates a larger area. So since the, the force has been spread over a larger area, the stress is lower and you don't uh, have such a high likelihood of failure at that location. So this is a good design. Another thing that we can do is create a fillet. A fillet is a rounded corner. Okay, So this also spreads the force over a larger area. So fillets are really nice. Um, the only downside with them is that sometimes they're a little bit harder to make than a chamfer. But either a fillet or a chamfer is a good way to avoid stress concentrations in your design. If your design includes an axle that needs to rotate, bearings are a good way to make that happen. There are two main types of bearings. The first is called a journal bearing. This is just simply a, a piece of metal that allows the shaft to rotate inside of it. Now, the inside of the journal bearing um, may be made of a special material that is good for uh, rotation. Journal bearings sometimes need to be lubricated as well, um, but they are a good simple way to allow shafts to turn. The other type of bearing is a rolling element bearing such as this one. Now you can see here that in this case the, the axle would sit inside of the inner ring um, and the outer ring would be fixed and then the inner ring is free to turn inside of the outer ring and the the metal balls between the two rings keep them separated and allow them to turn freely so either journal bearings or roller element bearings are good ways to allow shafts to turn in a mechanism sometimes machines include drawers or other things that should slide easily and there are different ways to design these things they could be designed wide and short or long and narrow. So you might wonder which way is better. So let's take a look at that. In order to understand what's happening, we have to know a little bit about torque. So torque is force times distance. Torque is kind of the, the force that is twisting something. So um, it's, it's calculated by force times distance. So imagine that you had a drawer that was wide and short. And imagine if you pulled on one side of that drawer. Let's think about what would happen if you pulled 
kind of where the red arrow is shown there. Well, you're a long distance from the side, so this creates a large torque. So when you pull on that drawer at that location, it, it tends to twist that drawer, which causes it to stick and jam. So it doesn't slide very well. Instead, it sticks easily. So this is not a good idea. Now let's think about the other option, a drawer that is narrow but longer. If you pull on the side of this drawer, it's only a short distance from the other side. So it creates a relatively small torque. Okay, And since there's a small torque, it doesn't have a lot of force twisting it. So instead of twisting and jamming, it actually slides easily. So that's good. So this is the type of drawer that you want to design. So if you want something to slide, it should be long and narrow, not short and wide. Sticking with the topic of things that slide, I want to talk about lead-ins for a minute. Lead-ins are a way to guide uh, one part towards another. So imagine that you had a block and it was supposed to fit into a position here. Now this block and this receptacle don't have any lead-ins at all. So if the block is just a little bit off-center, it does not slide into position. So you don't want to do this. Okay? Lead-ins are a much better idea. Lead-ins look more like this. Now if the block is a little bit off-position and it starts to move, the lead-in gently guides it to where it's supposed to be. So this is much better. Even better still is having a lead-in on the block and on the receptacle. This allows uh, for an even easier fit. So if you have things that need to fit together, try and put lead-ins on at least one of the surfaces that are supposed to meet. Now I want to talk about constraints. Constraints are things that hold other things in place. Now, you might think, well, if I'm trying to hold something still, the more constraints I have, the better. But actually, that's not always the case, right? Imagine that we are in a two-dimensional world that's flat, like a piece of paper, and we're trying to hold something in place, okay? In fact, imagine that we're trying to design a table for this two-dimensional world, okay? And we think that, all right, well, two legs hold up the table well, three legs will hold it up even better. But let's see what happens if you try and put that table on some ground that's not exactly flat. If it has three legs, it has a tendency to wobble. One of those, two of those legs can be in contact with the, the ground at any one time, and one of the legs is always going to be up um, if the ground is not perfectly flat. So this is actually called over-constraint. If you use more constraints than you need, we say that the device or the machine is over-constrained. And this is not a good idea, because instead of holding it where you want, it, it can make things wobble. Um, if you are talking about machine design, you need to have everything designed to very, very tight tolerances if you're trying to over-constrain something. So that can be more expensive and harder to do. So over-constraint is a bad idea. Now imagine that we're trying to design a table for this two-dimensional world, and we use only two legs. Okay, And we try and put it on the same ground that's still not quite level. Now, since there's only two legs, the ground and the table will be uh, together. So the table might not be perfectly level, but it will, the legs will always be in contact with the ground and it will be sturdy, all right? So this is called exactly constrained and this is what you are striving for. So the same principle applies to tables in our three-dimensional world, okay? If you have a table with four legs, um, it's going to be over-constrained. And if you put it on the floor that's not perfectly level, one of those legs is always going to be off the ground a little bit. It's why tables wobble. 
But if you designed a table with three legs in a three-dimensional world, that table, those legs would always be on the ground and it would be perfectly constrained. The same goes with ladders. If you have four legs uh, and you try and put the ladder on uneven ground, one of the legs is always going to wobble. If you have three legs, it will be, um, the legs will always be in contact with the ground and it will be, um, it will be exactly constrained. The same goes with wheels on a vehicle. If you have uh, four wheels, then one, and they're rigid, one of the wheels will be off the ground. Um, the way that we get around that with cars is that we use springs and we use tires that are a little bit uh, springy and, and have some give to them so that they can accommodate variations in road height. But um, if you had a vehicle with three wheels, it would be exactly constrained. It might also be slightly less stable, so you have to take that into consideration. But in general, exact constraint is what you're looking for. Let's review some of the things that we talked about in this presentation. First of all, keep it simple. Try and keep your design as simple as possible, and you'll have better luck. We learned that triangles are very strong and light, so you should include them in your design anytime you're trying to make something strong and light. You can use chamfers or fillets to distribute force in your design and avoid stress concentrations. Try not to have hard 90 degree angles because that's where stress can build up. Bearings can provide good support for axles. If you want something to slide, you should make it long and narrow instead of wide and short because long and narrow things tend not to jam. Put lead-ins on your parts so that they fit together more easily and apply as many constraints as you need, but not more. So these were some of the principles of design that we learned to help make your designs work a little bit better. Um, we just had a very brief introduction to these. Each one of these topics could be covered in a tremendous amount of detail, uh, but hopefully if you have these principles in mind, when you are designing machines, they will help you to start going in the right direction.